The Snowbirds are the most visible component of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Painted in their iconic red and white pattern, they tour North America putting on stunning aerial displays. The workhorse behind the Snowbirds for over 30 years has been the humble Canadair CT-114 Tudor, a high-performance jet trainer with a long history with the RCAF. The Tudor was the first in-house design for Canadair. Based in Montreal, Canadair had until then made a name for themselves building and upgrading foreign designs. These included the CL-30 Shooting Star Trainer, the CL-13 Sabre Fighter, and the C-4 North Star Transport. In the early 1950s, Canada was operating jet aircraft like the Sabre and the Canuck, but new aircraft were being developed at an enormous rate. Higher performance aircraft with expanded flight profiles like the upcoming American Starfighter demonstrated the need for an expanded training program for pilots. Canadair initiated a two-seat jet trainer program with the intention of replacing the existing propeller-driven fleet and to keep pace with advancements. It was hoped that the design would be completed ahead of the anticipated contracts from the RCAF and other Allied Air Forces for a new jet-powered lead-in trainer. There were other designs being developed concurrently by countries including the United States and the United Kingdom. Aircraft like the popular Cessna T-37 Tweet and the VAC Jet Provost had their first flights in 1954, around the same time the Tudor was being designed. Despite this late start, Canada was confident that they could compete in the Allied market for jet trainers. In February of 1951, Designer Carl Erbitus, who would later go on to design the innovative CL-84 vertical takeoff and landing swing-wing aircraft, proposed a first version that was simply called the Jet Trainer. It was to be produced in several versions to reflect the operational requirements. In the primary trainer role, the Tudor was supposed to have a wide flight envelope in order to replace both the Harvard and the CT-133 Silver Star trainers already being used. The initial design series was oriented towards perfecting the spin initiation and recovery performance to align it with the training requirements. The CL-41-1 was proposed in January of 1954. It had most of the features present in the final production design, but had a low set tail wing. Wind tunnel tests found this configuration to be too sensitive to student inputs when entering and exiting a spin and so the design was revised. The CL-41-2 had a T-tail and went through many iterations between 1954 and 1956 to determine its optimal position along the tail rudder. Using models in a wind tunnel, the wing was raised incrementally from its low set position to the familiar T-tail configuration to determine its best placement. In January of 1956, the CL-41-3 was proposed. It had a tandem seat configuration similar to that of the Harvard and the CT-133. It was not pursued beyond paper studies due to the fact the RCAF had indicated they wanted a side-by-side -side trainer. The CL-41-4 was a further modified version of the CL-41-2 model. It included a larger tail rudder, increased cord for the vertical fin, and refinements surrounding the placement of the tail wing. This model was tested extensively and showed the desired flight characteristics. By mid-1956, wooden mock-ups were built and the design was more or less finalized. Canadair began soliciting governments to fund a flying prototype. Funding for the construction of two prototypes was secured in September 1956. The Government of Canada decided to jointly fund the project alongside Canadair, and the project began to pick up momentum. The CL-41A was designed to be well suited to the lead-in trainer role. It first flew on January 13, 1960. Performance of the new jet was respectable and compared favorably to its contemporaries. The Tudor consisted of two main all-metal semi-monocoque structural units connected by four bolts. The forward section included the nose, cockpit, and center fuselage, while the rear section included the engine and tail services. The wings were mated to the center fuselage. A pair of speed brakes were located halfway down the tail section. This configuration enabled easy engine replacement and maintenance. 45 panels around the aircraft provided ground crews with easy access to any systems. The first prototype was equipped with a Pratt & Whitney built JT-12A-1 engine, 
This would later be replaced by the Orenda-built General Electric J85 Can 49 two-stage turbine producing 1,180 kilograms of thrust. This propelled the 3,357 kilogram aircraft up to a top speed of 888 kilometers per hour and up to a maximum altitude of 13,100 meters. The Tudor had a wingspan of 11.13 meters, a length of 9.75 meters, and stood 2.82 meters at the tail. The side-by-side -side cockpit was large and spacious with a wraparound rear hinged canopy. It seated the student on the left and the instructor on the right. This configuration allowed students to directly observe the examples given by the instructor, as well as allowing the instructor to directly evaluate the progress of the student. The crew sat in a pair of Weber Rowcat ejection seats, which allowed zero altitude, zero speed ejection. The Tudor featured a wide wheelbase for good directional stability on the ground and a robust undercarriage to resist rough landings. It also incorporated an internal skid framework to help protect the crew in the event of a belly landing. 1,137 liters worth of fuel tanks were located around the center of gravity in the main fuselage. This was done to maintain consistent flight characteristics regardless of fuel load. It had a range of 1,097 kilometers on internal tanks, but this could be extended through the use of two 455 liter external wingtip tanks. Due to the requirement that it be able to operate from older and less prepared runways, the first two Tudor prototypes were fitted with retractable air intake screens to protect the engine from the ingestion of foreign object debris. These screens would cover the intakes during landings, taxiings, and takeoffs, and then retract behind a boundary layer deflector in flight to minimize drag. These were later scrapped on the production version, but were brought back with the exported G model. Weapon mounts were included, but not initially used. It was intended that combinations of fuel tanks, guns, bombs, or rockets could be carried and deployed in the training role. Later, these two would make a comeback with the G model. Throughout the design, crew safety, crew communication, and ease of maintenance were top priorities. However, performance was not forgotten. The airframes were designed to take between negative three and plus seven Gs. This combined with a good rate of climb made the Tudor a solid aerobatic performer. This fact was not lost on the RCAF, who mounted smoke generators to the exhaust and went on to use the toot for most of its display teams. Canadair and later the RCAF would perform extensive structural tests on the airframes to ensure that they would be able to handle this aerobatic strain safely. Flight testing of the first prototype continued while a second was produced. The second prototype was built to be a stripped down and cheaper version of the A model. Canadair intended to make their trainer as appealing as possible to as many foreign countries as possible. The lower cost B model was meant to make it more accessible to less well financed air forces. Modifications included replacing the engine with an Armstrong Sidley Viper and combining and minimizing the cockpit instruments. The idea was abandoned and the company renewed its focus on the potentially lucrative contracts of providing radar training for the many upcoming F 104 pilots. By 1959, Canadair had begun the slight modification and construction of around 340 F-104 Starfighters. It was this contract that led designers at Canadair to consider the creation of a new lead-in trainer for the high-performance jets. The single-seat Starfighter was expected to have low airframe hours requiring an efficient way of transitioning pilots onto the new type. The company wanted to fill the need for radar and all-weather navigation training, and so began incorporating additional systems into the 41's design. The B model was upgraded to the CL-41R standard through extensive airframe modifications and the inclusion of an R-24A North American Search and Ranging Radar, or NASAR, and its associated equipment. The redesigned toot was lengthened by adding a totally new nose section and had two side blisters along the tail boom to hold the additional equipment required to support the radar set. These blisters also provided a counterbalance for the heavy radar. The engine was upgraded to a Pratt & Whitney JT-12A-2 engine. The engine, along with the extra radar equipment, brought the gross weight up to 3,765 kilograms. This was heavier than expected and had an impact on performance. The engine was later upgraded again to an Arenda built J85J4. The performance of the R model was similar to that of the A, but with slightly reduced top speed and altitude. 
This model was cancelled due to lack of interest at home and abroad. The role of CF-104 radar training for the RCAF was left to three Dakota transports. These were modified to include the NASAR systems and a Starfighter-style nose cone. The CL-41R airframe was then used for vibration and fatigue testing. It now resides in storage at the Reynolds Alberta Museum in Wetasco in Alberta. The RCAF was pleased with the Tudor's performance, and they placed an order for 190 aircraft in April of 1962. The production model CL-41A was rolled out of the factory in Montreal on October 29, 1963. The only initial change from the prototype versions was the exclusion of the FOB screens. In 1964, four were being produced per month. Later, a toot would roll off the production line every five days. Several production techniques were used that would later help build the world's fastest hydrofoil, the HCMS Brador, such as mounting the airframes on a jig that reduced the workload by easily rotating to any orientation. A modification was proposed during the production to correct some of the aerodynamics of the Tudor and improve its spin recovery characteristics. Narrow spin strakes were mounted on either side of the nose to guide airflow at various angles of attack. Almost all the CL-41s were upgraded to include these strakes, the notable exceptions being early production airframes and those used as part of the RCAF's Golden Centenaires. The CL-41A Tudor, renamed the CT-114 Tudor by the RCAF, entered service on December 16, 1963. Several of the first airframes were attributed to various units for testing and maintenance training. The first operational tutors were assigned to training command at RCAF Gimli in Manitoba and began training pilots in 1963. The first class of pilots graduated in late 1964 and began transitioning to other types. The training program was expanded as more airframes became available. Instructor training was concentrated in Manitoba at RCAF Portage La Prairie, number one flying instructor school. Their instructors would familiarize themselves with the aircraft and refine their teaching skills. Primary flight training for student pilots would be concentrated with the number two flight training squadron, later renamed the number two Canadian Forces Flying Training School at RCAF Moose Jaw in Saskatchewan. The vast majority of tutors would be based there. The number two FTS would train all fast jet pilots in Canada as well as a large number of pilots from other countries as part of Canada's contribution to NATO and other allies. Pilots came from all over the world, including Tanzania, Malaysia, Italy, Denmark, Norway, and the Netherlands. The public got to see the new plane in late 1964 at an air show in Toronto. The Tudor was displayed at various other national and international air shows before an air demonstration team could be assembled. The first display team was the Golden Centenaires, formed in 1966 as part of Canada's centennial celebrations. It consisted of 10 modified tutors, painted in a distinctive gold, dark blue and red scheme. They performed from April 28th to November 18th, 1967, and was disbanded in January of 1968. In May of 1968, the Red Knight display team was re-equipped with the tutor following the crash of one of their T-33s. Two airframes were painted red with a white stripe down the fuselage and were used for demonstrations starting in the summer of 1968. Unfortunately, a fatal crash in July of 1969 forced an end to the program. Starting in 1976, instructors from the Flying Instructors School based in CFP Moose Jaw began demonstration flights with four or five unpainted aircraft. They were known as the Vikings Formation Display Team and performed at various air shows throughout North America. The group was moved along with the number two FIS from CFP Moose Jaw to CFP Portage La Prairie and then disbanded in 1984. The most famous Canadian display team is without question the Snowbirds. They were formed in 1969 when they began doing fly pass at Saskatchewan Rough Rider football games. These proved to be very popular and so they began touring air shows in 1970. In 1971 they were named the Snowbirds and then in 1975 they officially became the 431 Air Demonstration Squadron, but the old name stuck in the minds of the public. As did the distinctive paint scheme, which was introduced between 1974 and 1976. 
The team operates 11 planes, but only uses 9 of them during performances. Snowbird pilots are selected from other squadrons and trained together intensively before taking their show on the road. Mistakes and malfunctions can have fatal consequences when the planes are this close or closing at such high speeds. Tragically, eight pilots and crew have been killed flying as part of the 431, four of which were in front of the public. There have also been several non-fatal crashes. Even with these tragedies, the snowbirds continue to fly, and pilots continue to volunteer to participate in such a fantastic tradition of aerial mastery. Canadair had been actively promoting the Tudor to foreign air forces since the late 1950s, but with little success. The expected orders for the plane from Allied Air Forces were filled by competitors like the Jet Provost and the T-37 Tweet. In 1964, the company began to promote a combat version for use in weapons training and light attack roles. The Tudor had been designed from the outset to be capable of carrying external stores on six pylons, two under the fuselage and two under each wing. A CL-41A was brought back to the Canadair factory and was remade into the CL-41G prototype by adding a reflector gun sight for the pilot, a 16mm gun camera, and strengthened rough field landing gear. Foreign object intake screens were planned but not included on the prototype. The CL-41G began weapons trials in New Brunswick at RCAF Chatham. Further testing was then carried out in California and Florida where the toot was shown to be able to deliver a large diversity of weapons with great accuracy. The weapons tested included bombs, 2.75-inch and 5-inch rockets, 7.62mm gun pods, napalm, cluster bombs, and fire bombs. The plane was shown to representatives from the United States, Mexico, Ecuador, Colombia, Australia, and New Zealand, but they showed little interest as many similar platforms were on offer. However, Canadair did find some success in an unlikely place. The Malaysian Air Force was interested in a combat version for use as a counterinsurgency and interdiction aircraft, as well as as a trainer. Canadair modified the 41A according to Malaysian specifications and created the CL-41G Tebowan, which is Malay for WASP. Twenty copies were produced between 1966 and 1967, with delivery starting in July of 1967. The Tebowan saw combat against counterstate militias in the jungle near the border with Thailand. None were lost in combat, but several later crashed on various training missions as the plane aged. The last of the Tebowans were retired from Malaysian service in 1986. A civil version was also considered. This would have been used for civilian pilot training, or modified with an expanded cockpit to hold up to four passengers. It was intended that this model be used for high-speed executive transport, but the concept was not pursued due to lack of interest and possible competition in this category from the Cessna T-37A Tweet, renamed the Cessna Model 407. Like the civil version, the following versions were never pursued past the pen and paper stage, but showed the great potential of the little tutor. The CL-41J was a proposed VTOL version. It incorporated three small jet engines behind the canopy. A large door covered the engines when the plane was in forward flight. The CL-41K was meant to be a low-level reconnaissance version. It mounted three Vinton cameras in the nose alongside a terrain-following radar. The CL-41N series was intended to be a U.S. carrier trainer and sported reinforced landing gear and a strengthened rear fuselage to support an arresting hook. The CL-41T would have been a complete redesign for ground attack and troop support missions. It had two engines, terrain-following radar, and eight external hardpoints for weapons and fuel tanks. By the 1980s, Canadian Tudors were beginning to show their age. In 1980, the glass windshields of the Tudors were replaced by those made from polycarbonate. This was done to increase the Tudors' resiliency with respect to bird strikes. While this somewhat modernized the Toot, Further modifications were required. Communication equipment and other additional systems were needed for its training mission. In addition to this, the aircraft's avionics were aging and could no longer be supported. An upgrade program was put in place in 1985 to extend the life of the hard-working jets past the turn of the century. VHF communication equipment was installed to bring the Tudor up to compliance with commercial aircraft flying into civilian airports. 
The Tudor also received a UHF transceiver, dual channel intercoms, solid state power inverters, and a new blade style antenna behind the cockpit canopy. Even with these upgrades, the systems on board the Tudors were starting to age. After 37 years of service, the Tudor was largely retired from service with the RCAF in 2000. The notable exceptions being those still flying with the Snowbirds. The airframes were retired to RCAF Mountain View in Ontario, where they joined a mothballed Air Force. This abundance of low-hour airframes is one of the reasons the Snowbirds have been able to continue flying for so long. They were replaced by the CT-156 Harvard II and the CT-155 Hawk as the RCAF's lead-in trainers. Canadair moved on from the success of their CL-41 and produced other successful in-house designs like the swing-wing CL-84 Dynavert and the CL-89 and CL-289 surveillance drones. It would also continue to modify and produce many aircraft for the Canadian Armed Forces, such as the supersonic CF-5, which would provide both light attack and advanced training roles. The humble Tudor, or Toot as it was affectionately called, trained every fast aircraft pilot in the RCAF from the mid-1960s through past the turn of the century. But it wasn't just Canadians who benefited from its outstanding training qualities. The Tudor has trained hundreds of pilots from NATO and other friendly countries. During its service, the Tudor was involved with 67 accidents, resulting in the destruction of 65 airframes and the deaths of 22 pilots and students. Today, only the Snowbirds continue to fly the jet, and as the airframes age and fuel remain available, they too will eventually retire one of Canada's most iconic jets.